In this special episode, we are joined by Dr. James Selman, the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Guam. The focus of this episode is mentoring first-year, first-generation students in higher education. Previously on Teaching Like Ted Lasso. So James Selman, who I met at the mentoring conference at University of New Mexico, had a, a paper that he shared with me that talked about mentoring. I've always really tried to not overcomplicate things. So when I look at teaching, when I look at coaching, Number one, to be successful, you have to tell them why you're doing it. And uh, one um, leader uh, at Lady who runs this quite a big company, she said, she said, I absolutely get more out of mentoring than more junior person. She said, I learn so much for them. For me, success is not about the wins and losses. It is about helping these young fellows be the best versions of themselves on and off the field. And it ain't always easy, Trent, but neither is growing up without someone believing in you. Welcome, I'm Dave. I'm John. And this is Teaching Like Ted Lasso. Warning, we expect that you've watched Ted Lasso. There will be spoilers ahead and scenes that don't make sense if you don't have some familiarity with the show. So we are excited to bring to Teaching Like Ted Lasso, Dr. James Selman, uh, Dean at the University of Guam. James, uh, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? I was born and raised in Niagara Falls, New York. Got out of the snow by going to UNLV in Las Vegas, Nevada for my undergraduate work. And it was uh, too hot and dry there. So I went to Hawaii to study Chinese religion and Chinese philosophy at the University of Hawaii. And then my first job offer was at the University of Guam. And I've been here ever since teaching philosophy. And then I lost my faculties and went into administration. And I've been serving in administration for the past 23 years. And that's the College of Liberal Arts and Social Science. Yes. And you were saying you still publish? And I'm still doing research and still publishing. We have a book coming out this month on living Confucianism uh, strategies for harmony. And I have a paper in that book and starting another book with a scholar in Poland, Professor Jacobi, on the philosophy of the Lusher Chincho. The Lusher Chincho is the book written for Chincho Wangdi, the first emperor of China. Because he buried the scholars, or allegedly buried the scholars, he definitely burned the private libraries. You know, that's where Ray Bradbury got Fahrenheit 451 idea from, that the government would come burn your library. But that book was then kind of disparaged throughout Chinese history because it was associated with the tyranny of the first emperor. Um, but it's a very important piece of literature because it sets up uh, most of the literature for the Han Dynasty. And, you know, the Chinese people today still refer to themselves as the Han. So in a sense, the Lusha Chincho sets up not only the imperial system for China, but also the intellectual system, at least for the Han dynasty. So we're starting an anthology through Springer Nature, part of the Tao Companion series. There's a whole bunch of recent literature on explaining in detail all of the ancient classics of Chinese philosophy and literature. Oh, that's fascinating. Now, you also write about mentoring. That's how you and I first connected. We were at the, the mentoring conference at the University of New Mexico. And it was there where I talked to you a little bit about Ted Lasso. I know that you watched maybe the first couple of episodes. Did you get, were you able to get past that? Or was that uh, the extent of your familiarity with the show? Yeah, I only watched the first couple of, of episodes. But yeah, that's a very interesting uh, show. That guy's really in an interesting dilemma, uh, being hired to fail, but being a type A and being very successful at his interpersonal relationships, there's no way that he's going to fail. So watching the show is definitely not a requirement to be on this podcast. We're about 50-50 in terms of people who have watched the show or watched particularly even the entirety of the show. Uh, we just are, we're looking for, we're the ones who are trying to make the connections and then reaching out to people that we know who are 
doing the work and for where we are in terms of our themes as we're looking at mentorship. And you've written a paper that you recently pr presented. Yes, I just presented it at a, a World Congress uh, run by some company out of London, but they hold the conferences in Southeast Asia. And so I revised the paper, First Generation Students, Freedom, Equity, and Justice in Education, Applying the Advising, Tutoring, and Mentoring Process. The joke behind the paper is, you know, advising, tutoring, mentoring, ATM. When the ATM works well on campus, then after graduation, hopefully the automatic transfer machine ATM works well and the graduate does not overdraft their account. <laughs> So why don't you tell our uh, audience a little bit about what what's in that paper, maybe a, a quick little overview, and then we can dive into some of the other parts. The idea behind the paper, uh, it's kind of based on Rawls's uh, theory of justice. And part of the idea behind the paper is that to get uh, to improve equity, to actually get some equity in American higher education, we have to overcome the ideas of the rugged individual who could grab their bootstraps and pull themselves up by themselves, that to some extent our, our understanding of equality is not really leveling the playing field and not giving disadvantaged people who are least well off access to the social good of education and higher education. So what am I talking about? My theories of, of equality, Declaration of Independence thinking, you know, everyone's created equal. But we know that that's not really the case. Everybody has different talents. Everybody has different abilities. You know, some people have photographic memory. Some people can't remember what they ate for breakfast. So if the idea of equality in a mathematical sense of one for one equality works at all, in a Rawlsian context, that would be equal consideration under the law, that everybody should be treated the same in the court system, which we know is not true. We know we don't treat everybody the same in the court system because of institutional and personal racism and biases. So that the idea of mathematical equality doesn't really get us to where we want to go. Then, you know, the civil rights movement comes along with um, equal opportunity. But equal opportunity in the hands of a racist really doesn't mean anything. Right? You can have the opportunity to apply to a school or apply for a job, but are they going to take the application seriously or are they going to throw it away or not consider it seriously? So by the 1970s, it was becoming clear that equal opportunity as a civil rights movement wasn't really working. And philosophers started to return to um, utilitarianism to consider equal consideration of interests. I think many people since the pandemic have seen that picture of two guys standing on a, on a box looking over a fence, or actually there are two guys standing on two boxes looking over a fence. The tall guy can see over the fence, the short guy can't see over the fence, but they're being treated equally. By the equal consideration of interest, you would give one of the boxes from the tall guy to the short guy, and then they both could see over the fence. So that kind of equal consideration of interest proposes that we have to be able to treat people according to what they need. So the equal consideration of <clears throat> interest idea is the basis for equity. So that's what the paper is expanding on this idea that we need to open up the, to really level the playing field, to open up access to higher education. We need to treat people differently especially the first generation student whose family, whose parents aren't prepared to help the student with the homework, nor do they really have a complete understanding of how much time it will take the student to do their homework. So one of the uh, <clears throat> local issues here, families have uh, big family celebrations, and then they expect all of the children to participate in that family fiesta. But when you've got a term paper due, you need to spend some time writing your term paper and they, they don't understand how much time the student needs to do their homework. So the proposal in the paper is that everyone on campus, the staff, the advisors need to be aware of equal consideration of interests and start treating the students differently, giving them more time in advisement, in tutoring and in mentoring. So one of the pieces that really stuck out to me, and you've, you've alluded a little bit to right there, James, was 
the idea that this first generation, their, their family may not be able to support them, but sometimes they don't even know what is expected of them. Think about there was a piece on NPR a couple of years ago that was talking about first generation students who didn't even know what office hours might be. How do we make sure that we're articulating clearly and not just expecting them to know the ropes about higher education? One of the things that that we're doing out in Guam is we're doing more cultural sensitivity training. And what I've been recognizing is we need to do it both ways, though. Many of the professors are from the U.S. mainland. They're not, you know, indigenous Pacific Islanders. And they haven't studied Pacific culture. They don't know, you know, the mores and folkways and how communitarian the cultures are coming from, you know, rugged individualistic North America. But I started to recognize we also need to start sensitizing the students to mainland culture and to Asian culture. That everything isn't going to always go their way. One interesting comment where we're, you know, doing some equity surveys with the students and the students were complaining, you'll like this one, the math professor was requiring them to do the problem his way and only his way. And even if they got the same correct answer, he wouldn't accept the work because it wasn't done his way. And I, I want to try to tell the students that, you know, sometimes you just have to follow the directions. If you're, if you're doing your taxes, you can't be creative. If you become too creative in filing your taxes, you may end up in, a, in, in some state-sponsored room, you know? When you're applying for a federal grant, you've got to follow the directions. You can't get really creative. As the finance professor says, don't go into banking if you're too creative because it's not going to work. Bankers got to follow rules. And so the, the students need to be sensitive to the other side of the equation that you know every they're not going to be rewarded if they fail which which may be part of the shortcoming in sports where everybody gets a trophy now um, even when they they lose the game the following is a scene from season two episode two is it time for trophies uncle roy yeah yeah emily's mom bought everyone consolation trophies must be nice to just burn cash best dressed the stupid you're all wearing the same thing you. Right, you know what? Just get amongst it. Enjoy your trophies for winning nothing. Coach Kent. Look, when I was young, you got shouted at for losing. Same. But then tough love never bothered me. You know, as long as I knew the coach gave. <laughs> Oi! It's been an honour coaching all of you. I do hope you'll come back and play next year. But only if you f***ing mean it! <laughs> <laughs> how that's going to work out in the school of hard knocks later in life but training the staff getting the staff to rethink what their role is in dealing with first generation students in particular so that they they don't just immediately just send them on their way but rec- ask them you know do you know what you need to do next actually help them fill out the forms instead of just giving them the blank page and telling them to go on their way. And, and that's a big shift because we're not really into helping people on that level where everybody is going to treat every student that they meet as, as their mentee and as their 2T. That kind of shift, that's going to be difficult to change in all the world cultures, really, because asking for help is always a difficult issue in any culture. And then who's going to give you the help? That's interesting, James. It, it connects with some of the other people that we've talked been talking about about this topic. We had uh, someone on who was talking about mentorship and was making the point that some of the best mentor-mentee relationships go both ways. The mentees learn something from the mentors, but the mentors also learn something from the mentees. That might be the cultural aspect, but that might also be the mentor knowing, oh, it might be useful if I explain why it's my way, why we're doing it this way, not just. So one of our other guests who is a, an American football coach and a teacher, he found out the most important part of his job was explaining why. 
whether he was on the football field or whether he was in the classroom. He needed to be able to, I don't know if you know Simon Sinek's work, but this idea of the power of why, the power of purpose. The idea of giving and getting help. So one of the things I really took from your paper, I, I recognize all of these things about inequity and trying to create equity. However, I'm also someone who, and I don't know if I fall into those simplistic views, but I was someone who, and still am, I, this is maybe the place where I'm looking for some ideas to work, but I'm someone who might not offer help unless it's asked for. I, because I don't want to impose, I don't want to suggest that that person isn't capable. So, so I tend to not get in there and help. And what your paper had me thinking is, but they may not even know how to ask for help or that they can't ask for help. And so, so how do I, how do I navigate that circumstance, that situation? Have you seen the, that, that kind of situation before and, and what, what can I do about it? What can our listeners do about it if we fall into that problem? Oh, it's, it's very complex, right? As you say, it's, it's very complex. Because sometimes you might assume that somebody you might think needs help who doesn't need help. And then by asking them if they need help, you end up insulting them. And I, I've heard of these, these cases in, in the mainland where they were just, you know, targeting all of the minoritized students and trying to get them into like a tutoring program. And then, of course, the well-to-do, well-off students who were being minoritized, who had gone to private schools and knew how to form study groups, didn't need to be forced into a tutoring program, and that they kept receiving the email or the phone call uh, became irritating to the point where they started complaining that <clears throat> they were being treated differently when they didn't want to be treated differently. But you're right. On the other hand, some people won't know that they even can ask for help, let alone how to go about doing it. And how do you pick up those kind of, you know, nonverbal cues to see, oh, this person really needs a helping hand here? That's a very difficult question to answer. Just what you've been saying makes me think that, yeah, I, I don't think there's an easy answer. So I appreciate that. However, it does feel like the first step is, is communication. It's like I was saying with the office hours. You've got to be clear about what office hours are for. They're set aside time for us to be available for students. For me, there was the piece in the paper that talked again about often when we see folks who are struggling, who aren't doing what we think they are, we tend to ascribe things like, oh, they're lazy or something like that. And some of it is, again, maybe examining those, those tapes. If I'm saying that, or if I'm just, they don't care, you know, if they missed their third class in a row, they must not care about it. Instead, at least reaching out and making myself available, not maybe to the extent of here's the things you should do. It's a, I'm just worried. What's up? What What's going on? Yeah, and that's it's that kind of human to human contact that you would usually get from a real mentor, somebody who actually knows you, who's and you're comfortable with them. You're able to just openly communicate with each other. But to get to that that level of a relationship uh, takes time, and and that's what we're trying to push everybody through the system in four years or five years. Um, and it takes time to develop that kind of relationship. And then there are only so many people on campus that can develop the relationship also. So there are some basic limitations there. Something you mentioned earlier, James, kind of comes to mind. And it's this idea that you're training, you're trying to train everybody, right? You're trying to train faculty, staff, you're trying to get at, because again, it would be very easy for me to say, oh, that's somebody else's problem. Somebody else can talk to them about that. Again, be very much focused on what I'm doing and not, to your point, building relationship. And that's the big part of the connection of, of being there for them. So is there anything else in the paper or in your work with students that you feel the audience would benefit from as they're thinking about mentoring first year, first generation students? Oh, well, part of the paper goes into a, uh, a depth ecology <clears throat> rather than a deep ecology that 
kind of proposes that other theories of, of ecology are shallow. I'm trying to get, get into a deeper perspective, this idea of uh, existential parity, that we need to start thinking more environmentally that everything and everybody counts, um, even in the environment and non-human, um, that equal consideration of interests extending to other sentient uh, creatures. And then coupling that up with a moral corollary of the, what I call the existential commitment that to, as Confucius says, if you wanna take a stand, help others take a stand. If you want to advance, help others advance. And so having this moral attitude that everything does matter, that I need to be reusing my plastic and recycling my plastic, along with taking care of my neighbors and have this kind of deeper moral commitment to the whole ecosystem and each other. That's where the, the paper goes into these broader philosophical environmental concerns. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Later on in the series, Beard, one of the, the coaches... The following is a scene from Season 2, Episode 11. Here we go again. Give Ted yet another idea he'll take all the credit for. That's the job, son. Do you guys ever want to be in charge? Be the boss? Get all the credit? You know, we used to believe that trees competed with each other for light. Suzanne Samard's field work challenged that perception, and we now realize that the forest is a socialist community. Trees work in harmony to share the sunlight. Can't you just give me a straight answer for once? I think I just did. Yeah, yeah. So that, it's that mindset thing. And so much of our approach to science and technology is really being driven by the quarterly corporation report and trying to make the quarterly profit for the stockholders. So we've become so reductionistic in our thinking and competitive in our thinking that we're missing the, these basic facts acts of biology that the way the world's the world you know Gaia <laughs> Mother Earth is set up is a cooperative system and it's not about cutthroat competition but working together but but this this is part of the idea that we need to rethink our mindset of what we're doing to ourselves certainly the reason why it keeps getting perpetuated is it's working for some people and some people think well they'll get to be you know the guard in the concentration camp um, when they tear down democracy but at some point they're going to be in the concentration camp themselves so it's it's somewhat perplexing that just 80 years after World War II and 80 years after Stalin, that globally people are looking toward some kind of authoritarian uh, perspective to control their lives rather than taking control themselves and working together with their neighbors. Yeah, that, that competitive piece, which, again, I do hope you get a chance because I think you would see a lot of what you're talking about in the entire three arc because Ted on a, on a couple of occasions, and it keeps coming back, is he, he keeps saying it's not about wins and losses, right? It's about helping these young men become the very best people they can be. When we talked to the, the football coach, he was he had won a, a, a state championship, a high school state championship, and his perspective was the same. We want to support these players to be the best they, people they can be. That often translates into wins. Yes, I, we actually had that experience. Uh, I did the equity discussion with the dorm students. And one of the things that came out from the dorm students was that the second string on the basketball team was never allowed to play. Mm. And so I called up the, the um, coach and I said, you know, this, you're got, this is going to be released and I want to give you a heads up that this is the student complaint. And, and his first response was, well, we want to win the game. And that's what I said. Well, maybe winning isn't the score. Maybe winning is giving the students the chance to play. And he was like, huh? <laughs> I was like, yes, there it is. And it's the same thing in the classroom, right? We spend so much time making sure these kids do well on a test that's going to compare us positively to another district, another state, another country. And in the process, we lose, we lose our soul. We lose, uh, you know, what it is to be human. 
there are ways to be creative and there are ways are to not be creative, but it feels like we've taken away all the ways to be creative. I think that this idea of building relationships, of being open to hearing other people's realities, to still be able to say yes, and we're going to still have to do things this way because and here's our purpose, here's our why, but just being very clear about that. One of the things that also keeps coming up, you, you were mentioning concentration camps, was uh, an author who wrote a book called What Would Ted Lasso Do? and really connected the, the series to positive psychology movement, and in particular, Viktor Frankl, and this whole idea of who makes it through, who who has resilience and the folks who have resilience have found purpose, have found hope. Jason Sudeikis, who, who is one of the writers of the show and the star talks about when you fall down, you can either be a heap of bones or you can land like an Avenger and rise up. This is a choice. And so the, the whole show is about that choice. And what we want to do is, give that same choice to our students. We want to give that same choice to our teachers. And when you were talking, I was thinking the equity in the classroom with that ungrading. Have you heard of the ungrading move? Yeah. Instead of setting up, you have the absolute standard and everybody has to live up to your absolute standard. And to use the ungrading approach to grade each student according to their abilities and their success in mastering the course material rather than your absolute standard is one way to, to go about getting that equity in the classroom with a competition thing. Yeah. Believe it or not, Grand Valley's math department is a hotbed of ungrading. And that really is about building and creating relationships. And that's about listening. But yeah, human relationships, Confucius <laughs> takes us back to Confucius and, and building human relationships, the importance of of those relationships is the, the key to the meaning of human life, along with that that sense of, of purpose and what you're going to do with it. Yeah, very important. James, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time and for for navigating the, the time zone stuff for me. We, we really appreciate your, your, your thoughtfulness and your patience. And, uh, and yeah, please keep at it. I'm, I'm excited to see what comes next from you. Okay. Thank you very much for having me, David, and have a good, good evening. About building relationships, there is one question that I want to ask you. If you were going to coach a sport in another country, what sport would that be and what country would that be? I was afraid you were going to ask this question. <laughs> every every summer I sprained my ankle on football and I, I, I could never get into the, the football league. Maybe forensics. Is forensics a sport? You bet. So you want to coach forensics and where do you want to do that? Uh, oh, maybe Thailand. Oh, nice. Yeah. Any particular reason? I've been living in the tropics so long um, and the cost of living is is. Although it keeps going up everywhere, it's a little bit cheaper in Thailand. So that would be a, a place to retire. And my wife is Thai. Oh, nice. Nice.